Thanks for the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I start with a question. Who here in the audience already used chat GPT? Okay. Who never used chat GPT? Okay, so half of the audience doesn't know. Anyway, uh, when it comes to chat GPT, everything talks about artificial intelligence, intelligence like something which is out there and maybe it's going to overtake the world and it's going to kill all of us and then that. You, you find stories about that everywhere and so many people talk about that. So I want to show you what chat GPT actually is. Uh, it is inspired by the human brain but it's only inspired by the human brain. In the human brain, we have neurons, we have connections between neurons, the synapses, and uh, these connections together with the specific um, behavior of neurons allows, uh, to, allows us to do all the things we do, like moving, thinking, and, 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 and. So the artificial neural networks, they have so-called artificial neurons which are connected to each other in, in a very specific way and the way how they are connected basically uh, forms the possibilities of this network so a network could look like this and so basically the output of one neuron to the other neuron is is uh, multiplied by weights and all the, the inputs here are summed up and maybe the neurons get activated and so on and so on. It's rather complicated. But when you see how the artificial neural networks today are formed, you see ChatGPT is a so-called large language model, which is a very special form of model. And it's based on those artificial uh, neural network technologies, which is called transformer networks. Transformer networks have been introduced in, in uh, 2017 only. So it's very, very new, a very recent development. And what they have is a so-called self-attention process. The self-attention process, uh, I will explain in more detail later. And the interesting thing is this technology allows to form sentences which are structured like similar sentences written by humans. So in some way, they mimic the, the, the formulation algorithms we use in our brains to form sentences. And uh, the network of, of ChatGPT uh, uses GPT 3.5 and it has a cutoff date of this September 2021. So all data which was available in the internet or basically all data until September 2021 is in the network somehow stored. But one had to have to know the chat GPT doesn't only know the internet, but it underwent a, a supervised fine tuning process, which is really time uh, consuming and, and expensive. And uh, in such a fine tuning process, humans uh, provide conversations where they play both the user and the AI assistant. And the AI assistant learns what is the correct answer. And this was done by OpenAI basically or mainly in Kenya, in Africa, and in other low paid countries. Uh, the, they paid around $2 per hour for people who did this. And I have to say, open AI is everything but open. So what is the impact of ChatGPT? ChatGPT is the fastest growing app of all time until now. Uh, UPS, the, German, the, the Swiss bank estimated that ChatGPT had about 100 million active users in January, only two months after it was launched. Uh, for comparison, it took about nine months for TikTok to reach the, the 100 million user level. Uh, another thing in, in Jet GPT is uh, the new model, uh, GPT-4, is very complex. It can perform this task because it's so complex. And if you compare complexity with the most complex uh, mechanism on this planet, the human brain, you can see that uh, 
the parameters Gen GPT version 4 uses or GPT version 4 uses is in the same order of magnitude as the human brain has synapses, those connections between neurons. Well, it turned out it's about 100 times less uh, because uh, Chat GPT didn't, didn't provide the numbers. Uh, 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 OpenAI didn't provide the numbers. And the other thing is a direct comparison to the human brain is difficult because only to, to simulate one single biological neuron, one needs at least about 1,000 artificial neurons. So the human brain is much more complex at the end. This is something Chris wanted to point out. So what is a transformer network? A transformer network is a quite complicated structure, which basically uh, takes input strings like what is thinking, for example, and produces uh, output probabilities. So which words have to come from these words? And this is done in a way, well, everything is in the name. GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer Network. Generative means the model is capable of generating uh, continuations to provide an input. Let's keep that in mind. The, the model only continues what the input starts with. And it tries, it, it does this by, if you give it some text, it tries to guess which words come next. Nothing more, nothing less. Pre-trained means the model is pre-trained on a very large corpus of general text, which is taken from the input. And transformer means it's a specific type of set, supervised encoder, decoder, deep learning model, whatever that is, with some very interesting properties that make it especially good at language modeling. Um, so words in a sequence it ends to other words because they capture some sort of relationship. Let's take the, the sentence. The alien landed on Earth because it needed to hide on a planet. So the word alien has some information or has some um, uh, relationship to landed on, doesn't have much relationship. Earth has relationship to alien but also planet has a relationship to alien. The planet, but planet has a relationship to Earth, but not really to because, and not really to need it in that context. And the relationship isn't necessarily known. So this makes transformer networks so good in predicting. It can be uh, resolving uh, pronouns, it could be verb and subject relation, it could be two words relating to the same concept like earth and planet. And whatever it is, if you know that there are relations between words, it makes it possible to predict the next word. So <laughs> the question arises, but why are large language models so powerful? Where does this power come from? And what do they really do in answering questions? And this is very simple. Large language models do exactly one thing. They take in a bunch of words and try to guess what word should come next. Mm -hmm. It's just a probability guess, nothing more. It's no thinking. And so please know, if you don't think this is reasoning or thinking, then it's only a very, very specialized and limited form. So there's no, no fear that these networks will do something on their own. They cannot do that. And large language models are trained on a massive amount of information scraps from the internet. And this includes books, blogs, news sites, news sites, Wikipedia articles, Reddit discussions, social media conversations, and, and, and. And during the training, a snippet of text is, is um, taken from one of these sources, and the network is Ask to guess the next word. That's all. And it's trained what the next word is. And so it learns the probabilities of sequences of words following sequences of words. And why is chat GPT so powerful? And this is very simple. It is important not to underestimate how diverse the text on the internet is in terms of topics. And chat GPT has seen them all. So 
ChatGPT has seen billions of conversations on just about every topic, so it can produce words that look like it is having a conversation with you, but it is not. It has seen billions of poems about everything, and so it can produce text that looks like this poetry. But it depends on seeing these billions of poems before. It has seen billions of homework assignments and the solutions. So it can make reasonable guesses about homework, even if it's slightly different. Or it has seen billions of standardized test questions and their answers, billions. And do we really think that these year's questions are that different from last year ones as about? And it has seen billions of people talk about their vaccination plans. So it can guess words that look like vacation plans. Okay? So it's only a guess. It's, it's not thinking. It's nothing in the end. So and when you look in the number of parameters, the parameters basically are um, a measure what the, the model can be capable of. The more parameters, the more the model can, can uh, do. So uh, GPT-4, uh, the exact number is still unknown. They, they never uh, revealed the number. It's expected to be about one trillion. Uh, from Huawei, there's a network available, which also has the same, same number of, of parameter. Google has a network with 340 billion and then and, and, and these are only new LLMs in, in 20, uh, 2023. So we really can expect a huge, huge number uh, of new models coming up every month. When you ask ChatGPT, what are the benefits and risks of LLMs in the context of teaching? You get a very structured answer. The, answer, the, the structure of answer always, the, the response, let's say, to the type of question like this is always the same. It's blah, blah, blah here which is a, a generalized answer. Then there's a list of benefits. Then there's a risk, a list of risks. And then you get uh, an addition, which says it might be wrong and different and you have to account, take into account many more things. So it's a, it's a structure which allows many interpretations in the end. It can be right, it can be wrong. Okay, the benefits are very interesting. Access to vast knowledge, yes, of course. Uh, personalized learning would be, why not? 24-7 uh, availability, yes, of course, it's a machine. Multilingual support, well, try uh, the Slovak language. It will be difficult. There's a huge difference between German and English. There's much more English text on the internet than German text. So the, the answers in, in English are, are usually more accurate depending on the on the issue. Uh, what are the, the risks? Lack of human impact? Yes, of course. But is that such a special risk? If there's no human, the lack of human interaction is a risk, of course. Limited contextual understanding? Yes, of course. There's limited contextual understanding because, because ChatGPT doesn't understand anything. It understands nothing. It just guesses the probability of words following other words. And of course, this has been written in the internet for millions of times. Uh, potential biases. These are risks of all neural networks. Whatever you feed into the network, the network is the truth for the network. And if the, if the bias is, is fed in into the network, the conclusions of the network are wrong. Uh, Reduce creativity and critical thinking. This is interesting because um, I'm sure all of your students use ChatGPT. There might be some exceptions, but not many. And in that context, they might use it in a way which doesn't train their creativity anymore because it's creative on its own. Uh, Over reliance on technology. This isn't very very uh, special. I mean, if you have technology and you only arrive, uh, rely on technology, you're always going to be in trouble if the technology is available. If we rely on electricity and we have a blackout, we have a problem. 
So this is not very difficult to, to sum this up. Another interesting thing is, especially in computer science, um, there are many uh, AI tools for programming. Uh, the, the best known probably is Copilot, which is integrated in almost all environments now and really gives interesting tips to, to students who do programming. But when you write, write the most basic program uh, in C++, you get an answer like this. Certainly, the most basic program in C++ is typically there and so on and so on. And it goes on explaining everything in T-Play, which you find on the internet this you find on the internet at least a million times. So it's not really difficult to do that. So try to ask more tricky questions. How can you staple three eggs? Obviously you can't, <laughs> unless you cook them. <laughs> and uh, so there is probably, it is quite difficult to find probabilities for the words. So what ends up is something like stepping X is not a practically recommended task as it would result in the X being damaged or broken, yes. And then it uh, goes to, to um, the attention of X, what are X and, and deliverance and X. And uh, if you're looking to connect three X uh, together in some way, there are alternative methods, which has nothing to do with stepping and then, then, then. So you see, if you get, if you ask questions which might be nonsense and where no answers are found on the internet, the, the probability algorithm starts to uh, invent things. It doesn't, it doesn't, it cannot produce answers because this thing doesn't know what X are. But let's get some more specific questions. How was the castle of Graz destroyed? This is easy to answer for me because I'm a citizen of Graz. And Graz is a 300,000 uh, inhabitants town in, in Austria, and it's German speaking. And everybody knows the history of the castle in Graz. It was destroyed uh, during a war uh, with Napoleon, but it wasn't destroyed by Napoleon because Napoleon couldn't conquer the castle. And uh, when peace finally came, one uh, order was to destroy the castle. So they had to destroy the castle for, <laughs> uh, because Napoleon wanted it to be destroyed because, because he couldn't conquer it. There's not much found about the story in the internet. Well, there are stories if you specifically look for it. But if you look at the words, castle, grass, and so on, you won't find probabilities pointing to these stories. So ChatGPT can't answer these stories. Well, this was the castle and this is how it looks like now. You clearly can see that, that part and everything has been destroyed. But a different question. Uh, what is interesting in the altar in the church of Heiligen Kreuz am Vast? This is a very interesting altar because it stems from a huge church in former, in former, former uh, Yugoslavia, which was Austria before World War I. And before World War I, this altar was taken from Marburg and brought to, to Heiligenkreuz and to the small uh, town uh, to be hidden away from, from, from uh, uh, the war. And so it remained there. Well, this is, has nothing to do with the question. You won't find English uh, text to that in the internet, so that's why the answers are, are, are that strange. Well, this is the altar and this is the church, so you clearly see that this doesn't belong into a church like this. Uh, AI is coming to stay. You even find uh, courses on the internet now which, which allow you to find the right fonts, the right text to get right answers. I don't know what this is going to do, where this is going to lead us, because it depends on the AI and, and I'm not really sure uh, how teaching to, to formulate the right prompts uh, serves for any purpose. Well, we engineers, we have a very interesting challenge. Whatever we do, it must work in the end. So, what we do basically is, well, I, I skipped that. 
uh, we need AI to do our tasks better. So what we have to do is we have to incorporate uh, AI into our teaching. We, we cannot forbid AI. It's, it's absolutely uh, pointless to detect the AI, generate the text, and, and uh, to not allow students to use that because they're going to use it and we can't detect it anyway. So you might, you might uh, recognize a certain style, but it's more important to, to concentrate on the result. So what we believe is, uh, I go here. What we believe is, <laughs> we should we should concentrate on on what the students really understood. We should talk about the code that generates. And when it comes to scientific theses, the the general part, like the, the theory and and the summing up of of principles. It isn't of any relevance anymore because you can do it with ChatGPT and any other AI tool. But the basic work behind that, what the student really does to solve the problem remains the same. This cannot be done by the AI system. So we have to focus on that. And uh, I don't know how many, much, uh, two minutes. Also, I'm very good in that. <laughs> Uh, what we have to change, of course, is the way how we do exams. Hand in a program which does this and that, well, they hand it in, but we don't know what they did. And so we have to focus on, on what we intend to teach. Uh, did they have to solve some specific tasks and to, to look on how they did that? And at least they have to explain what they did. So I believe exams are going to be much more difficult in future than now and uh, what we did in, in the final exams in, in the master program is the the defense of the thesis uh, is much much more aggressive now so we ask much more aggressively and we ask really difficult questions and uh, we, we challenge the students that they have to explain what they did and why they did it. So it's relatively easy to find out if they did the work, but it takes more time. And it takes uh, time to, to uh, teach teachers how to do that. Well, if we have uh, recommendations uh, for lecturers, the lesson themselves should be open to AIs. So everybody, everybody can uh, do research on the, uh, can, can do search on the internet now, and everybody's going to use AI in the future for, for whatever purpose. Well, the conclusions. The main conclusion for me is application of generative AI cannot be stopped and should not be stopped. We have to incorporate it into the teaching and interactive performance assessments are the preferred to simply hand in seminar papers or homework. And to maintain the competitiveness of our society, computer science education must proactively integrate this issue. And therefore teachers must be involved. Thank you for your attention.